This is Twit. Today, I've got two really interesting new electric vehicles that have come on the market. Uh, they're two of the first electric pickup trucks that are available. We've got the brand new 2022 Rivian R1T from a brand new automaker. You know, this is their first product. And from a company that's been around for over a century, the Ford F-150 Lightning. And uh, this is an electric version of the best selling vehicle in America. I'm Sam with Blue All Salmon. Let's take a closer look. All right, so on my left here is, this is the Rivian R1T. This is a new, new company, new truck, um, and it's quite, it's different. It's different from, especially different from this F-150 Lightning. Uh, in fact, these two, these two vehicles, even though they share the same basic form factor of a pickup truck, they're not really direct competitors. Um, the Rivian is quite a bit smaller than the F-150. It's about 16 inches shorter overall. It's narrower. Uh, it's not as tall, at least in its normal stance. Um, and this is really targeted. This is what Rivian calls a lifestyle truck. Um, this is for people who like to adventure, go outdoors, hit the trails. This truck is really more of a, if anything, probably its closest direct competitor would be something like the Jeep Gladiator. You know, this is designed to hit, you know, some of the toughest trails, uh, go places where you wouldn't normally go with a vehicle and do it all completely emissions free with a giant battery pack. The F-150 on the other hand, this is the, the newest version of Ford's workhorse. The F-Series is the vehicle that pays the bills for Ford. The profits that Ford generates off of F-Series sales, which in pre uh, chip shortage in pre-COVID years uh, amounted to almost 900,000 vehicles a year in North America are what pay for the $35 billion investment that they have promised in electric vehicles between now and 2025. And this is uh, a significantly larger vehicle. This is much more of a traditional pickup truck. This is designed for the F-150 buyer, really. Uh, you know, for the same people that would buy a gas F-150, this is the electric truck to meet virtually all the same needs as, as those customers want from a gas truck. Uh, it's based on the same general architecture. The, the, it, obviously, it looks familiar because it uses the same cab and bed structure so that all the same accessories that you would use on any other F-150 will fit right in the bed. Uh, it also has a what the Ford calls their mega power frunk, uh, which is a 14 cubic foot front trunk. And uh, Rivian also has a frunk, which is also power operated. Uh, theirs is slightly smaller. The frunk in the, in the Rivian is only 11 cubic feet versus 14 cubic feet in this one. Um, but you know, there's also other storage that the Rivian has that the Ford doesn't have. But I think probably what's the most critical part of all this, uh, the, the most critical difference between these two for the frunk, is that Ford opted to attach what would normally be the grill on a gas F-150, which is now just a solid panel because it doesn't need cooling airflow for an engine anymore. They attach that to the hood. So now you have a relatively low lift over height and, you, and very easy to access the front trunk in the, in the Ford. And there's also an additional compartment down below here that features a drain plug. So you can put, put wet gear in there and it'll drain down in. And the Rivian also has uh, a, a secondary compartment below where the, it stores the, um, the charging cord, uh, but there's also a drain plug in there. For, so when you put your wet gear, if you've gone to the beach, or if you wanna have what Ford has now dubbed the front gate party, as opposed to a tailgate party, uh, you can fill that with ice and cool drinks and, and food. And uh, as the ice melts, it'll just drain right out the bottom. So easy to clean. Uh, but the Rivian, because they kept this front structure here at, you know, as, a sol as a stationary part of the structure, um, the lift over height, if you want to put stuff in the front, is quite a bit higher. One more detailed difference of these two trucks is the keys. The Ford has a very traditional looking key fob. It looks just like the key fob you would get with a gas F-150, except uh, it has a couple of buttons labeled a little differently. Uh, the Rivian has a key that is shaped like a carabiner, 
uh, for very much, you know, again, the lifestyle theme. Uh, and along with this key, they also give you an NFC card that you can keep in your wallet. Uh, you can use a phone app, they use the Rivian smartphone app to unlock the vehicle. You can also do the same with the Ford Pass app for the Ford. Uh, to unlock the vehicle. Uh, and there's also uh, an NFC wristband that you can get that's completely waterproof uh, so that if you're going surfing or uh, going swimming in a river or you know, whatever it is you're doing that um, you don't want, if you don't want to take your key along with you, you can just put on that NFC wristband and take it in where, wherever you go and then just tap that on the door to unlock the car. One of the interesting design architectural differences that you have with a lot of modern electric vehicles is what they call a skateboard chassis. Because the battery is so large, what they've done is they've, uh, this was an idea that was actually developed over 20 years ago at General Motors by uh, a researcher there named Dr. Christopher Baroni Bird, uh, is this, this idea of the skateboard. Because all the components for an electric drive system can be made very, com or at least very thin, uh, what, they, what he came up with was the idea of putting the battery and the motors down low uh, and basically building everything up on top of it so you can put different what they call top hats, different, different uh, body structures on top of uh, a skateboard chassis. So all of the propulsion components, the motors and the battery, are all self-contained inside the skateboard. Where things get a little different between these two is because Rivian is starting from scratch. They're not using an existing body structure for the R1T. This is a unibody design that sits on top of the skateboard. Uh, so there's no separate bed and, and cab like you have with the more traditional F-150. And uh, next year when Chevrolet brings out their uh, Silverado EV and the, also the GMC Sierra EV, they're following a similar architecture to this uh, with a unibody design, although theirs is going to be larger and it also features some other unique things like their, their mid-gate. But we'll get into that next when, later when, uh, when they actually give us more detail on that. But for now, uh, one of the really cool details that Rivian has built into the R1T is the gear tunnel. So you press the button up here and there's behind the cab, between the cab and the bed, there's a tunnel that goes all the way across to put your stuff in, which gives you another 11 and a half cubic feet of storage in addition to the front trunk. They also have some interesting uh, features, that, uh, accessories that you can get. And also, the doors on this gear tunnel can hold up to 400 pounds. So um, the, the gear tunnel uh, one of the coolest uh, accessories they have is the so-called camp kitchen, which actually go, slides right in, includes an indu electric induction stove that hooks up, runs off your battery, um, and a sink and a, a bunch of other things. So you can slide it out when you go camping. You can have basically a full kitchen there. Um, there's also uh, a, uh, a glide track that you can install in there. So if you're putting long objects in there, you can stick surfboards in there. I did, uh, I'll include some photos in here of uh, me trying to stick my uh, inflatable paddleboard in here. With the bag, it doesn't quite fit. It's a little bit too thick. The, the door, the opening's not quite large enough. But with the board by itself without the bag, I can slide it right in there. And since this is the launch edition, which comes equipped with all of the available options, um, unfortunately, it's already sold out. So if you haven't already ordered your launch edition, you won't be getting one. But you can still get all these accessories. Just um, you have to pick them out separately and add them to your order when you order an R1T. Uh, one of the features they have on here is a power operated tonneau cover, which press the button and it closes up and it completely locks up anything that's stored in the bed. So you have a completely yet another completely locked storage area uh, to keep your goods and keep all your stuff safe um, and then you can open it back up again to use it as just a regular pickup bed so if you have taller items that you want to stick in there um, again because this is this is a mid-sized truck um, you know it's quite a bit smaller than the f-150 the bed is over a foot shorter than the one in the f-150 and the total volume in here is only about two-thirds of what you get in the F-150. Uh, but because this truck has four electric motors underneath, over 800 horsepower uh, and over 600 foot or over 900 foot-pounds of torque, um, it is still very capable. It has an 11,000 pound tow rating and this particular truck has about a 1,400 pound payload capacity. Both of these trucks have their charge ports on the 
left front side of the truck. In this case, on the Rivian, it's right up in the corner here. And you just press right there and the charge port door opens and you can plug it in and charge it up. The Lightning's charge port is a little bit further back behind the front wheel on the driver's side. Push it in, it pops out. And again, you have access to a CCS charging connector here. Uh, both of these can be charged from any CCS um, either, se either from a level two 1772, um, that's your home average home charger, this five pin port, or you can take it to any uh, CCS DC fast charge station and charge it up there. Um, and that uses all seven of these pins here when you do that. Uh, the F-150 can charge the maximum of 150 kilowatts uh, from a, D a, a DC fast charger. The Rivian can charge it up to 200 kilowatts. Uh, both of them have close to the same size battery pack. The F-150 has, this F-150 at least, has the extended range battery with 131 kilowatt hours of capacity. The Rivian has 135 kilowatt hours of capacity. That's from its middle size um, battery, battery pack. That's what they call the large pack. They also uh, later this year have coming their standard range pack uh, which will give it about uh, about 100 kilowatt hours of capacity, similar again to what the standard range pack in uh, the F-150 will do. One feature that is unique to the F-150 Lightning that you won't get on the Rivian is bi-directional charging capability. Um, when you get the extended range battery pack for any F-150 Lightning, it comes with Ford's Charge Station Pro, which is a bi-directional charger, uh, which means that not only can it pump electricity into the battery, it can also take it out. So when you combine that with the optional uh, home integration kit, uh, then what will happen is when you have the truck plugged in, if your power goes out, the home integration kit will automatically flip um, the transfer switch to disconnect your house from the grid and start pulling power from the truck. Uh, typical American household uses about 29 kilowatt hours a day of electricity. And in this truck, you've got 131 kilowatt hours on a full charge. Uh, so you can run your house with everything you would normally be using for about three days and still have about 35% of your battery left, uh, which would be close to 100 miles of charge left on this 300 mile charge uh, truck. Uh, and both of these trucks will go over, will go at least 300 miles on a charge. Uh, for this uh, F-150, which is a Platinum, which is, has 22 inch wheels, it'll do, it's EPA rated at 300 miles. But uh, based on my testing so far, it should be able to do actually a little better than that. Uh, and the Rivian is officially EPA rated at 314 miles. If you get the other trim levels of the F-150, uh, the XLT or the Lariat or the Pro with the extended range pack, they'll do 320 miles. Uh, the standard range pack uh, will do about 230 miles. Another feature that the F-150 Lightning has that actually debuted uh, about a year and a half ago when they launched the hybrid version of the F-150 is something called Pro Power on Board. Uh, a lot of uh, commercial users, a lot of professionals use F-150s as work trucks and in a lot of cases, especially um, people like contractors, um, construction people, uh, oftentimes they, will, they would have to carry a uh, generator with them uh, to a job site to power their tools. With uh, the launch of electrified versions of the F-150, including the hybrid and now the battery electric lightning, uh, they can take advantage of the battery power and the electric motors that they have to use the truck itself as a generator. And so uh, this one, uh, the, the, both the hybrid and the lightning come standard with 2.4 kilowatts of output and they get uh, in the case of the uh, Lightning, it has 10 AC, uh, 120 volt AC power plugs in it. So there's four here in the bed. There's another four in the front. Uh, and then um, there's an optional 9.6 kilowatt. So the base version has 2.4 kilowatts of output. There's an optional 9.6 kilowatt version that you can get that also adds a 240 volt outlet for charging your really heavy tools. Uh, so when I first went to uh, background briefing on the Lightning last year before they revealed it publicly, they were doing a demo where they had a cement mixer, shop lights, miter saws, uh, an air compressor, and a whole bunch of other tools all running off the Lightning simultaneously. So you can power a whole job site with this truck. Um, and uh, while the Lightning has slightly less towing capability than the Rivian uh, at 10,000 pounds, 
uh, it's still more than ample for almost anything you're going to want to do. But the Lightning, uh, because it's larger, also does have a um, slightly higher payload capacity. Um, the, this particular one, uh, the, uh, this Platinum, because of all the accessories and options it has on it, it's, it's heavier than some of the other trim levels, uh, has a payload of 1,660 pounds. But um, with the base version, the Pro, uh, you can, and the, uh, the standard range battery, you can get a payload of up to 2,200 pounds. Uh, in this truck and uh, and then also up to 10,000 pounds of towing capacity. So going back to the beginning, as I said, these two are both pickup trucks, um, but they're not quite direct competitors. This is a truck that is designed to do all the things that a traditional F-150 does, especially being a work truck. Um, Ford launched it with a work truck a trim level uh, that you know avoids most of the options uh, but does all the things you would expect a working f-150 to do it has a higher payload capacity similar towing capacity and more cargo volume the rivian is really more for a, more of an adventure truck um, it's you know the f-150 can go off-road there is an off-road uh, mode in here that changes some of the settings. Uh, there's also a locking, uh, lockable rear differential. So it has some pretty decent off-road capability, but because it is longer and has a lower um, ground clearance, it's only a nine inch ground clearance compared to up to 15 inches with the Rivian, uh, it, uh, it's not really quite as capable off-road. The Rivian has a four wheel air spring suspension system that can lift uh, the ground clearance from the standard 11 and a half inches all the way up to 15 inches. It can forward through up to 42 inches of water, whereas the F-150 can only go through about 24 inches of water. Uh, so if, you're, if what you want is an electric truck to go off-roading, this is probably the better choice for you because uh, it's smaller, narrower, it's gonna be easier to maneuver in tight spaces than the F-150 is. And with the extra ground clearance, uh, you're going to have um, a, a lot easier time getting over big rocks and boulders than you will with the F-150. So let's take them both for a drive. We'll start with the F-150. So starting off with just a little quick intro to the interior here. Uh, anybody that's been in a current generation, recent generation F-150 will feel perfectly at home in this truck uh, because what Ford has done is basically taken the standard top hat of an F-150, the, the cab structure and the bed, uh, and reskinned it slightly on the outside to make it a little smoother, a little more aerodynamic. Uh, but basically inside, they've used almost all the same components from any other F-150, uh, which helps them to keep the cost down to offset the extra cost of things like batteries and motors. Uh, so they've used the, they've leveraged the economies of scale they get from building 900,000 F-Series trucks a year. Uh, so things like door panels and shifters and, and armrests and all the other elements in here basically come out straight out of any other F-150 with one exception, of course, which is this 15 and a half inch touchscreen display. This, uh, if you've seen the inside of the Mustang Mach-E, will be very familiar as well because it's the same screen that's in the Mach-E with basically the same user interface um, and uh, including the, the glued on uh, volume control knob here down on the bottom of the screen. Uh, everything else, uh, basically standard F-150 from the stop start button here uh, to the shifter. Uh, one of the interesting details about the shifter is uh, on these current generation F-150s, you can press a little button here, the shift lever rotates down into the console and then you can fold this up and you have a nice big work surface. So if you're use, using this as a work truck, you can put your laptop or tablet or whatever down here, uh, or you can also use it for as your lunch table or whatever else. Um, the uh, uh, This particular F-150, which is a platinum, it's the highest trim level, also has the optional um, fold flat seats, which go all the way back down. So if, if you're wanting to take a nap while you're charging your truck, uh, or just you know taking a break at lunchtime, you can Lay back down, be nice and comfortable. So um, again, most of the other features on here are standard F-150, so you've got things like Pro Trailer Backup Assist, which um, makes it a lot easier when you're backing up a trailer. And this knob uh, basically takes over most of the steering control, and you just turn the knob in the direction you wanna go, and it'll handle the steering to help you back up. It's great if you're backing up a boat down a, a boat launch uh, or anything else like that. All right, so let's go for a drive. So first thing you'll notice in this truck, it's very quiet. 
uh, you know, no engine noise at all. And that quietness extends, you know, throughout the operation of the truck. Uh, everything about this, um, you know, is so much more refined than any standard F-150 you'll ever drive. So the, uh, the user interface on the screen here, as I said, it's the same interface that you'll find in the Mach-E. It's uh, what they call Sync's, uh, the Ford Sync 4A system. Uh, so you've got a number of uh, applications that can run on here. Right now I've got the navigation up here, uh, but you can also have uh, things like your media controls, uh, Amazon Alexa, Android Auto. Hey, navigate to Michigan Stadium. There is a Michigan Stadium. 5.7 miles away on 1201 South Main Street. Do you want to get directions to that one? Yes, please. Obey traffic laws. Be alert and use voice commands while driving. So in uh, these newer Ford and, and also Lincoln vehicles, you now have the option of up to four different voice assistants that you can use when driving a Ford or Lincoln vehicle. You can use the standard built-in Ford voice recognition system, which has actually gotten a lot better over the years. Uh, it used to be pretty bad, but it's 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 much more reliable now. It's it's a hybrid system that, like all these others, is actually connected to the cloud. Uh, so it's much closer, not as close as others, but much closer to natural language voice recognition. Uh, there's the Alexa voice services that you can uh, connect to your Amazon account, and that will uh, allow you to do uh, various vehicle controls, uh, like. Um, navigation and climate control and so on. Or if you're using Android Auto, you can use Google Assistant. Uh, or if you're using Apple CarPlay, you can use Siri. So any one of those, sometimes there's duplicate functions between the two, between all those. But uh, as I said, the, the interface here, uh, you've got whatever your current app is, is in the top half of the screen here. And you can actually also expand that even, even further. Uh, and then recently used apps, will appear in this carousel down at the bottom. And so when you, you know, if I want to go to the Android Auto interface, just tap on that and it switches places and navigation goes back down here. And it'll, sh it'll still show me the navigation prompts down here if I'm using the nav uh, <clears throat> and switch to whatever else I have up here. And I can quickly go back and back and forth again. So the most recent stuff is here and then you can scroll across for the, the next three most recent uh, apps. So right now, we are going to take a little drive, go up uh, onto the freeway. So I can show you Blue Cruise. Uh, Blue Cruise is Ford's hands-free driver assist system, uh, which recently launched launched uh, last fall uh, on the F-150 and the Mach-E. Uh, and this is most similar to uh, General Motors Super Cruise system. Uh, in fact, so, so much so that uh, GM actually tried to sue Ford uh, for copyright or trademark infringement for using Cruise, and Blue Cruise, uh, when uh, GM is already doing Super Cruise, they have their Cruise Autonomous Driving Division, uh, and they've also got another system coming out next year called Ultra Cruise, which goes even further than Super Cruise, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so once we get on the highway here, uh, I will demonstrate uh, Blue Cruise. So this is a system that uses four surround cameras five radar sensors. Uh, so there's a long range radar on the front of the truck and four corner medium range radar sensors. And you can see this truck accelerates very quickly. It's 560 horsepower, 775 foot pounds of torque. I've engaged the uh, Blue Cruise, which is a hands-free system. That doesn't mean it's self-driving. The system in some ways actually goes farther than what you can do with Tesla's autopilot because it's actually designed to be hands-free. Uh, unlike autopilot, which is meant to be a hands-on system. This system features two infrared cameras up here, one on either side, that are constantly looking at the driver when you're using either Blue Cruise or the co-pilot assist. It's designed to look at your eye gaze and your head pose to make sure you're paying attention to the road because you do have to be ready to take over control. Um, and in fact, more so with this system than with GM Super Cruise. Um, in, in the GM system, uh, they have higher definition maps that allow, uh, that, that actually look, are used as essentially a look ahead sensor. So it, the maps have topographical information, road uh, curve radius information. And if you're approaching a curve in the road that your current set speed is a little bit too high for, it will actually um, slow the vehicle down a little bit as you approach that curve and then automatically resume your previous speed as you exit the curve. The, 
Blue Cruise does not do that right now. Uh, it will be doing that in the future when they're after they switch over to a new mapping system that has more detailed information. Um, and uh, but for now, it, it does a reasonably good job of, of hands-free driving. I do have a few complaints about Blue Cruise. So. Um, for example, uh, and most of it has to do with the user interface, aside from what I just mentioned with the uh, curves. Okay, so right now it's telling me to keep my hands on the steering wheel because um, actually I'm on an off ramp here going to another highway. Uh, and the Blue Cruise uh, is not able to handle that right now. Uh, but the with Super Cruise, with the GM system, and also with uh, some other systems, uh, like the, the, the latest Mercedes-Benz drive pilot system, uh, they feature lights in the steering wheel. So in the case of Super Cruise, there's a light bar across the top segment of the steering wheel that can go between off, uh, red, green, and blue. Blue means it's ready uh, to use. Uh, green means that the system is currently active and you can go hands-free. And red means that you have to put your hands back on the wheel and resume control. And um, that is, is actually a really good thing. It should, it's very clear, very unambiguous what mode the system is in. Uh, in the case of the Ford system, they have uh, a graphic display in the instrument cluster here that is a predominantly blue theme, and it's not always immediately obvious when there's been a mode change when you need to take over control. Uh, so I think that's a little problematic. The other issue that I have uh, with the, the interface for Blue Cruise is, uh, again, GM opted to put install uh, capacitor sensors in the steering wheel. So when it does want you to take control of the steering wheel, it knows when your hands are on the wheel. It can sense, actually sense your hands on the wheel. Ford, like Tesla and some other manufacturers, uh, is just relying on a torque sensor in uh, the steering column uh, that detects slight motions from your hands uh, and tries to use that to, to decide that, yeah, your hands are on the wheel or they're not on the wheel. So right now I'm back in hands-free mode, but there are times when, I'm, uh, when I have to be in hands-on mode when this torque sensor system uh, sometimes, you know, if you're holding the wheel, you know, particularly steady, like on a road like this, it can't actually detect, it, it gives you false positives sometimes, uh, because it thinks that if the steering wheel is not moving a little bit, that your hands aren't actually on the wheel. It's not, it's not a direct interface or not a direct sensing system for, um, for your hands on the wheel. And I think that Ford should have done that a little differently and, and gotten the capacitor sensor room. Um, I've talked to Ford engineers about this, and they are making changes. They've, made, they've already made some changes in the software calibrations, and this latest version compared to versions I drove several months ago does have fewer false positives that your hands aren't on the wheel when they, when they should be, uh, but it's, it's still not as good as, as other systems. Um, also, you know, thing, features that Super Cruise has that this doesn't are things like auto lane change capability now um, and uh, you know, automatic overtaking which uh, that will be added to Blue Cruise at some point in the future, but it's not there yet. One other um, little minor complaint I have about Blue Cruise is um, compared to Super Cruise, if you're watching the road, uh, like if you, for example, if you watch the edge of the fender relative to the lane markers, you will find that Blue Cruise does tend to wander a little bit more within the lane. It doesn't go outside the lane. It doesn't cross the lane lines, but compared to Super Cruise, it does wander a little bit more sometimes which is a little bit annoying um, and you know, not, not quite confidence inspiring but overall it generally works pretty well um, but as I said not as good as Super Cruise. So overall you know the F-150 Lightning as I said is going to feel very familiar to anybody that's ever driven a modern pickup truck um, and you know that's good. It, you know, this is designed to be a truck that does truck stuff and Ford took a obviously took a very different strategy with this truck compared to what Tesla wants to do with the Cybertruck or what Rivian is doing with the R1T. Um, they started with the base F-150 platform uh, which is a good solid platform um, yeah. and the, the thing about trucks, pickup trucks, you know, they are uh, more traditional body on frame architectures 
So it's actually fairly straightforward to take a traditional pickup truck and make it electric. In this case, what Ford has done, because they wanted to keep the entire top hat uh, of the, the vehicle, the, the bed, the cab and the bed, uh, retain that, uh, they kept the same mounting points. They designed an all new frame, which holds the battery pack and the motors. Uh, so it has the same mounting points, but it's not the same frame that you'll find in a gas F-150. Uh, and they, they filled the gap between the frame rails with the battery pack. Uh, in this case, it's a 131 kilowatt hour net battery pack. Uh, there's also a standard range version with 98 kilowatt hours uh, that gets you 230 miles of range. And it, uh, uh, and then uh, put the motors in and then drop the, the body on top of that. Uh, so what General Motors is doing for their upcoming Silverado EV that's coming next year, um, they opted not to use the same body as the gas F-150s, or the, sorry, the gas Silverados and the GMC Sierras. Uh, they designed a new body, which is a unibody, so it's not a separate bed and cab, uh, which gives them some advantage. Uh, but that also allowed them to move the mounting points, move the frame rails outward, so they can actually get a bigger battery pack, over 200 kilowatt hour battery pack, which will get them over 400 miles of range. This truck, this particular truck, which is a Platinum, it's the loaded model, uh, which has all the options on it, uh, including 22 inch wheels, uh, will go about 300 miles on a charge. Um, if you get the XLT or the Lariat with the extended range battery, they will go um, about uh, 200, or sorry, about 320 miles because they're only on 20 inch wheels, so there's less rolling resistance, less inertia, um, and a little bit less weight. Um, so they'll go a little bit farther. And then the, the base version of the truck, uh, as I said, will go 230 miles on its smaller battery. Um, one of the uh, nice benefits of having that big battery pack in between the front and rear axle is it spreads out the weight more. With a traditional pickup truck, you've got big chunk of the weight in the front where the engine is and then when it's unloaded when there's nothing in the bed the back end tends to be lighter so you typically have about a 65 35 front to rear weight distribution which uh, can be uh, challenging in slippery road slippery driving conditions um, because you know without uh, without weight on the rear axle to give it some extra traction uh, it can be um, it can be it can sometimes be a little more challenging to drive so you have to be more careful uh, when you're driving a truck in those conditions. I know when I was in college, I had a, a small pickup truck and uh, you know, rarely had anything in the back and it was definitely a handful to drive in the winter. Um, but with this battery spreading out the weight more evenly, this truck, when it's unloaded, actually has a 50-50 front, front to rear weight distribution, which actually makes it handle significantly better than a traditional pickup truck. And with the, um, with the 560 horsepower and 775 foot-pounds of instant torque, uh, this thing just accelerates faster than any F-Series pickup ever built. Uh, it'll do 0 to 60 in just over 4 seconds uh, with the extended range battery, which is quite impressive. So let's see what this thing will do 0 to 60. That's 70 miles an hour. <laughs> That's pretty quick. So. Uh, yeah, this is this is definitely a fun truck to drive. Uh, it's also very capable. It will tow 10,000 pounds. Um, and when I went on the launch drive program in Texas in uh, uh, in May, uh, actually had the opportunity to tow a 9,500 pound trailer with a Lightning. And unlike most uh, trucks, you know, when you put a trailer that heavy on there, you can feel the load. You can you can feel it not accelerating as fast. With the uh, with the Lightning, with the 9,500 pound trailer, it almost didn't even feel like there was anything connected to it, which was quite remarkable. Um, you will get a reduction in range um, when you're towing, um, just as with a gas truck, you're going to get significantly lower fuel economy. Uh, but the difference is with the gas truck, you know, typically you might get about half your normal fuel economy. So if you're getting, you know, let's say 18 miles per gallon. Uh, in normal driving with a gas F-150, you might get nine or ten uh, with uh, when you're towing a trailer. Uh, with this, um, you're also going to get a reduction. It's going to depend how much uh, on the weight and the, the shape of the trailer. With uh, if you have a shorter trailer that is below the height of the cab, so for example here in Michigan, uh, you will often find in the winter time uh, if you drive up north, drive to northern Michigan, you will find. 
it's almost convoys of people pulling their uh, snowmobile trailers up north uh, to go uh, to go uh, snowmobiling for the weekend, or uh, in the summertime, jet skis and boats. Uh, you know, so those are lower trailers and not as much aerodynamic drag because they're kind of in the slipstream of the truck. And uh, you'll, in that case, you'll probably lose about 25 to 30 percent of your range. So in the case of a 320 mile uh, range lightning you might be able to go uh, about, uh, say, 230 to 240 miles uh, with that truck. Um, if you have a tall trailer, like a horse trailer or a camper trailer, uh, then you're going to lose probably closer to 40 to 50 percent. So you might have anywhere between 160 to 170 miles of range. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of that. Uh, one of the things that Ford is trying to do to help with that is that uh, when you first hook up a trailer, um, they give you some QR code stickers to put on the tongue of the trailer, and uh, you can calibrate uh, each trailer. So if you have multiple trailers, you can calibrate each one separately. Uh, so you hook up the trailer, put the QR code on there, the rear backup camera looks for that QR code when you hook up the trailer, and you can save multiple trailer profiles. And with the, um, uh, when you calibrate it, it'll go up, it'll measure how much energy is taking to pull it. So they, they ask you to go out and drive it for about 10 miles. It generates a profile for that trailer. Uh, and then it factors that in to the range estimation when you're driving. So at least, even though you're gonna get less range, you'll have a, a more accurate picture of the range. Other things that they factor into that uh, range model uh, are things like when you use the navigation, uh, it knows the, it'll look at the topographic information for the route. Uh, so if there's a lot of hills, you know, it'll factor that in, or if it's a flat road, it'll factor that in. And it also pulls in weather information uh, for your drive route. So it does that in real time. Uh, so it, if you've got really cold weather or really hot weather uh, or strong headwinds, all those things will be factored in. Uh, so even on this uh, dirt back road here, uh, it's still you know, quite, a, quite a comfortable ride for a pickup truck. Um, the ride quality in this truck is exceptional. It is, uh, I would say, probably the best riding truck uh, I've ever been in. You know, and prior, prior to this one, I would say the, the best truck I've ever driven uh, you know, has been the Ram 1500, uh, which has a solid axle in the rear, coil sprung, uh, so it has, has much better ride quality than uh, traditional pickup trucks have had. But this one with its four-wheel independent suspension uh, is even better. This particular one, again, because this is the Platinum with the, the fancy, big fancy wheels, uh, you can go off-road in it. Not recommended on these particular tires. This, these are really more intended for street use uh, or you know, just like dirt, dirt road use, on paved road use. Uh, if you really want to go off-roading, you probably want to get the XLT or the Lariat trim with some all-terrain tires on there. And I've driven that um, and it works shockingly well uh, in you know, muddy conditions or over, over rocks. It's, it's not going to be competitive with what you can do with the, uh, with the Rivian, for, for example. The Rivian, if you're going to do off-roading, the Rivian is going to be a much better electric pickup truck for you than this will. One of the, uh, the things that uh, I also really like about uh, Ford's approach to EVs uh, compared to some other brands like, for example, Toyota, is uh, Ford has really bought into the one-pedal driving mode, so the strong regen. Uh, other manufacturers, of course, do this as well, like Tesla and uh, uh, BMW. Um, so uh, just as in the, uh, the Mach-E, uh, in the vehicle settings here, uh, you've got different drive modes. You've got normal, sport, off-road, uh, tow haul. Um, and then you can turn on one pedal driving and throughout this entire drive I've only touched the brake pedal uh, a few times um, you can get enough regen this this decel is just from lifting my foot off the accelerator and I really like one pedal driving especially in uh, uh, in stop and go driving if you're in traffic it's it's great because you don't have to go back and forth between the accelerator and brake pedal uh, it takes a little getting used to you know how much to modulate the pedal for the amount of deceleration you want but lifting your foot off the accelerator will bring the vehicle to a full stop and it'll hold it there um, the tow haul mode uh, when you use that uh, it gives you uh, uh, some other advantages one of one of the the nice things about um, an electric truck when you're towing with a gas or a diesel truck um, when you're towing in hilly country um, there's a, a, a uh, you, you have to uh, 
use uh, trailer brake control sometimes if you have a heavy trailer. Um, and also when you put it in, when you put those trucks into tow haul mode, what it'll do is change the transmission shift points so that it will uh, downshift when you're going down hills, use engine braking. So you're not using all, all of your friction brakes uh, for uh, all, the, uh, all the braking when you're going downhill. Um, with an electric truck, um, it'll just ramp up the regen. And so instead of uh, overheating your, your friction brakes um, or making a lot of noise because it's and using a lot more fuel because it has had to downshift to get your engine speed up, uh, it'll just use the regen and just put all that energy back into the battery. So you can actually get, you know, you, <laughs> if you're going down a long hill, uh, like if you're driving in the mountains, in the, you know, say in Colorado or something like that, you can actually end up with more range at the bottom of the hill than you started with at the top of the hill, uh, just because of the amount of energy you're putting back into the battery from regenerative braking. Um, this also has uh, a locking rear differential, again, for that off-road mode. And uh, when you put it in off-road mode, it also changes some other settings, like the uh, slip control settings for stability control and so on. Uh, sport mode uh, changes the throttle or the accelerator mapping uh, so that it's a little more responsive when you step on the accelerator. I'm coming to a stop here without using the brake pedal at all. And sport mode. That was 60 miles an hour, there's 60 right there. Now one more cool feature of the uh, F-150 Lightning, this is actually a feature that debuted on the gas F-150s last year, um, and it included it on the Lightning, which is the smart hitch and the onboard scales. Um, so the onboard scales, uh, Ford now includes load sensors underneath the bed, uh, which allow you to basically weigh how much uh, cargo you're putting in the bed. So this particular truck, uh, this because it's a platinum, it's a little heavier than the uh, some of the other trim levels, it's got a 1600 pound payload capacity. Uh, so as you load up the bed, it will, the scale here will go up and tell you when you're full, uh, so you don't overload it, uh, which is handy. Um, again, that's another feature that's factored into the range estimation. There's also a load sensor in the hitch uh, so you can you'll know how much tongue weight uh, you're putting on the hitch and again as with the the onboard scales It's factoring that into the range estimation uh, So as you when you hook up the trailer as it as you put it down on the on the hitch It will know exactly how much tongue weight you have on there So again, so you don't overload the truck uh, for safety reasons, but also to help with your improving your range estimation so overall the uh, F-150 Lightning is really an outstanding product. It's an outstanding truck. Um, if what you need is a full-size pickup truck, um, and, you know, especially if you need one for work, um, this is you know uh, this is a great uh, vehicle, a great choice. Um, overall cost, uh, especially when you factor in the tax breaks, is pretty similar. Uh, to a gas F-150. Um, Ford does, in, with the extended range battery, Ford does include the uh, 80 amp wall charger, the Charge Station Pro, which enables the bi-directional charging. So if you, uh, if you get the um, home integration kit from Sunrun, you can use this for whole home power backup. If, uh, if you have a uh, power outage at your home, uh, it can power your home, power a typical home for about three days if, if you don't change any uh, behavior or turn anything off and if you actually turn some stuff off that is not essential you can actually potentially power your house for up to 10 days with it um, the uh, you know the, the, all the, the features on here that are unique to this truck are really impressive um, aside from long distance towing um, everything else about this truck is I would say better than the gas f-150 uh, long distance towing being the one exception and that's has more really to do with the charging infrastructure that we have right now than anything else yes you're gonna lose range but you know even with a gas truck you're going to have to stop more frequently to charge up or to, to fill up um, but it's more convenient it's quick um, and the way gas stations are configured you drive through pull up to a pump uh, fill it up and then you're on your way uh, most EV charging stations right now, most DC fast charging stations are configured with the chargers where you pull in 
you know, where, where it's like a regular parking spot with the chargers either on the side or at the end. Um, and they're not really configured for vehicles with trailers, which is not great. Um, Electrify America has started to put in uh, charging stations or has started to build out some charging stations that have drive-through bays. Uh, so it's configured more like a gas station. Um, so you don't have to disconnect your trailer or block other uh, charging bays uh, when you're using the uh, when you're using the charger. Um, and that I think right now they have about eight to ten percent of their chargers. So about about eighty somewhere around eighty to a hundred of their existing uh, DC fast charging stations are configured with some drive-through bays. And they are going to do more of that, especially now that we're starting to get more vehicles like this that are capable of towing. But aside from that, everything else about this truck. It does it better, it does it quieter, does it smoother, does it faster than a gas F-150. Uh, so I would strongly recommend, you know, if you need uh, an electric, or if you need a full-size pickup truck, that you seriously consider getting an electric one, whether it's the Lightning, uh, or if you're waiting till next year, uh, we'll see you know, about the GMC Sierra and Chevy Silverado. Uh, and then the year after that, the Ram 1500 is also getting an electric version. Uh, and maybe even someday the Cybertruck. Uh, but electric trucks are fantastic, um, and they're they're definitely worth uh, consideration. But if you're <laughs> if you if you are considering it, um, especially in the near term, you'll want to get your order in now. And wait, you know, get in line because um, there's still limited availability uh, this year. I think Ford is planning to build by the end of this year. Ford uh, I think hopes to build about between 50 and 60 thousand of these trucks. By the middle of next year, they're expanding production capacity. Uh, they plan to be at 150,000 annual run rate by the middle of 2022. Um, and I think their their target was to build about 250,000 trucks or so by the end of 2022, um, which is way more than what they had originally planned uh, because they didn't realize it was going to be this much demand. Um, and uh, uh, it, you know, so there's there's a lot of orders for these, um, and it may take a while to get one. So if you're interested, um, get your reservation in now. Uh, and that is the um, all electric Ford F-150 Lightning. And now let's take a look at what it's like to drive the Rivian R1T as a comparison. As you can see, the interior of this truck is quite different from what you have in the F-150. Um, this is a much more modern, much more, in a lot of ways, minimalist interior, but unlike the interior of a Tesla, uh, it definitely has a far more premium feel. You know, despite the high prices that Teslas have commanded for the last decade, they never really felt like a luxury vehicle. This definitely feels much more like what you would get in, say, a Range Rover, aside from, of course, you know, the lack of physical controls. But this feels like something, you know, I can imagine the, the SUV version of this, the R1S, definitely feeling more like a Range Rover as a competitor to a Range Rover, uh, or at least, you know, like a Land Rover Discovery. Uh, you've got really nice uh, open pour wood trim around here. Um, vegan leather. It's not, not uh, no animal hides in here. It's all vegan leather. Uh, but, you know, it looks very expensive. It looks premium. And again, unlike at least the Tesla Model 3 and the Model Y, there actually is an instrument cluster display directly in front of you where it belongs when you're driving, not off to the side here. Another thing that uh, we have in here is an infrared driver monitor camera. Uh, it's not clear if this is actually being used right now, uh, but it will be in the future as they expand the capabilities of the ADAS system. You've got details like uh, the Rivian uh, name etched on the uh, right, hand right hand end of the dashboard over there. Also the little launch edition badge, which means this is one of the first uh, couple of thousand units. Um, the, the launch editions are all sold out, so if you haven't already ordered one, you're not going to be able to get one now. But you can get all the other features that are in here. Um, like a Tesla, you know, Te Rivian has gone minimalist on the controls, gone for the, you know, incorporating as much as they can into the touchscreen interface here in the center, um, and then using rockers and uh, rollers here on the steering wheel spokes. Uh, so on each steering wheel spoke, there's a, a knurled knob that you can roll up and down to do, make various changes. Uh, so things like volume control, and what they actually do changes depending on the mode you're in, uh, which 
can be a little confusing um, because there's no labels on here, so never quite sure exactly what uh, what's going to happen. Um, so you know, if you want to change the steering wheel position, when you go to the, this page here on the screen, uh, you can move the steering wheel forward and back with the right hand rocker, um, and then uh, up or down with the left hand rocker. Um, similarly, with the mirrors, you can adjust the mirrors the same way, left and right. Uh, and then down here, um, you have various controls like navigation, uh, media control, uh, your drive modes, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, this gets you uh, your, your trip computer and various vehicle information. So this is telling us you've got a green R1T launch edition, your VIN number, uh, all the various other information is there. Um, and trip computer information is right here. So uh, total distance driven, efficiency, not real great, 1.62 miles per kilowatt hour uh, since this has been reset, uh, which is not terribly impressive. Um, and that is one of the downsides of this truck. Uh, it, it's not a very, not a particularly efficient vehicle uh, as EVs go. It's not as bad as the GMC Hummer EV, but still it could be better. And we'll see how this does on this drive. Driving the, um, the Lightning so far, I've averaged about 2.2 miles per kilowatt hour, which is um, you know, certainly not in the same neighborhood as uh, some other EVs, but um, definitely um, you know, among, among the best for trucks right now, uh, which is good for about 300 miles of range. So let's, uh, let's go for a little spin here. And put the, the shift, uh, the transmission selector here is just the right-hand stock up for reverse down, uh, double down tap, gets you the uh, Rivian Drive Plus mode, which is their ADAS mode, uh, similar to Tesla Autopilot, and we'll try that out when we get on the highway. All right, let's go. And get the ventilated seats going so they don't make quite as much noise. So you got heated and ventilated seats, also heated steering wheel, all those very handy in an EV um, in either hot or cold temperatures because um, the uh, heating of the seat and the, and the steering wheel, uh, it's very direct uh, contact uh, heating, uh, which is much more efficient than trying to heat all the air in the cabin. Uh, similarly, the ventilated seats, you can feel the, the cooling effect right on your backside. Um, so it doesn't have to use quite as much energy as using the standard uh, uh, climate control system. So in the instrument cluster here, um, I've got uh, speedometer uh, and power level on the uh, right hand side. Uh, in the middle is where I'll have the display for the driver assist when I get out on the road. And then uh, the map on the left hand side showing me where I am and when I'm using navigation, it'll, it'll show me that information as well. You got a variety of con connectivity options here in the uh, R1T, uh, a standard Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. There's an LTE radio built in, uh, so there's a Wi-Fi hotspot. There's uh, built-in support for uh, Homelink, uh, so you can set up your uh, garage door openers uh, if you have them. And there's also a speaker in here somewhere. I think it's down here. Um, that uh, you can, it's actually removable. Uh, it's a Bluetooth speaker, so you can pull that out and, and use that as well. And then under vehicle settings, you've got the ability to set up all the, all the usual settings here. Uh, there's some apps, um, HD radio support, uh, Alexa, different keys and drivers. Uh, one of the uh, fun little details that they included in here in the settings under vehicle is uh, somewhere there's actually a, a show and tell mode um, I think it's, oh, here we go yeah so you can set the interactive lighting for the light bars um, and it'll show it uses the light bars uh, front and rear that pulse green when it's charging so you can see you can you know if your if your car is parked if your truck's parked outside and it's plugged in you want to see if it's actually charging you want to you want to just look out the window instead of going all the way out. You can just glance out and if you see the, the light bar in the front or the rear pulsing green, you know it's actually charging right now, which is handy. Um, and then there's uh, charge port light uh, that pulses when it's locked, auto high beams. Oh, here under the service uh, menu, 
you have the show and tell mode. So, for and this I think is specifically for people that are taking pictures of their uh, their Rivian trucks uh, when it when it's turned off uh, and everything's locked up. You can still have the lights on, um, so you can get uh, you know get some nicer pictures with all, with all the lights on. Um, get uh, software updates right now everything is up to date and then the driver plus mode is the that's the ADAS suite uh, so uh, I'm gonna set the lane departure warning to normal forward collision warning is on normal automatic emergency braking is turned on uh, you can select your warning types I'm gonna go for vibration for lane departure uh, there's lane keeping assist, which I'm going to turn on. There's blind spot monitoring. Uh, the R1T has 11 cameras around the outside of the vehicle, uh, so that's more than even uh, Tesla. Uh, the Ford only has four cameras, so it's front and rear and two side cameras. Um, this one has 11 cameras. Tesla uses eight cameras on theirs, and they have and three of those are in the front here. They've got a trifocal front camera system. So that uh, beeping there was telling me that the turn signal was still on. I'm going to turn on the Drive Plus system here. So unlike the Ford with its hands-free Blue Cruise, this is a hands-on system. So it's much more, right now at least, it's much more like uh, Tesla's Autopilot, uh, which is designed to do lane centering and it doesn't, it doesn't, not such a great job there, trying to keep the truck in the middle of the lane, uh, and adaptive cruise control, so it maintains a gap to the vehicle in front of you. And on the instrument cluster here, I can see the vehicle in front of me, that truck that just passed me on the left, now shows up in the left-hand lane here. And uh, you'll be able to see all the, the vehicles to the sides and in front of me as they appear. And, uh, uh, as I said, there's 11 cameras, there's five radar sensors, uh, so same as the Ford. You've got a long range radar sensor in the front, uh, plus four medium range corner radar sensors to detect cut-ins uh, when, um, you know, when you're in, using the uh, Drive Plus or, or anything else, uh, or using the adaptive cruise control, the car moves over into your lane uh, and it's too close. Uh, the corner radars will be able to detect that and automatically back off your speed a little bit. And even though it's, it supposedly has lane centering capability, it doesn't really do a particularly great job of actually trying to keep, even with your hands on the wheel, it's not really doing very much to actually keep the truck centered in the lane um, compared to something like even Nissan's ProPilot Assist, which is a, a pretty basic system that only has a single camera and a radar sensor. Um, you know, that does a, generally does a better job of keeping the vehicle in the lane than this does. So this really kind of tends to wander quite a bit. Uh, you know, if you're just driving normally, hands on the wheel, um, it's, it's fine. And the, the two rear corner radar sensors uh, are very handy as well, because they provide, in addition to blind spot monitoring, uh, also provide rear cross traffic alerts. So when you're backing out of a parking spot in, uh, in a garage or in a, in a parking lot, uh, they can essentially look down the aisle as you are backing up uh, and let, give you an alert if there's anybody approaching from either direction. So there is a little more wind noise in this truck than there is in the Ford. Uh, even though the mirrors on this truck are quite a bit smaller than those on the Lightning, I can, I can hear some wind roar around them. Um, there's also some noise ar around the can't tell if it's the door seals or the, probably the door seals, not so much the window seals. Uh, but I can hear a little more wind noise than I did in the Ford. Um, also, given that this one has all-terrain tires on it, whereas the Ford really had street tires on it. So these, this has Pirelli Scorpions, uh, which are really good off-road tires. Um, they're inherently going to make more noise. Uh, and so you can hear some of that road noise being transmitted up. The, the rest of the interior of this truck, uh, as I said, in addition to the wood trim on the dash and the door panels, uh, you've got a nice, uh, I don't know if it's actually Alcantara or just some other brand of microfiber uh, for the headliner and the pillars. It uh, looks, looks nice, comfortable. Uh, you've got a uh, full glass uh, roof panel here, um, which unlike you know, the Ford uh, also has the optional 
um, glass, panoramic glass uh, moonroof. The Ford does open, uh, so if you want some open air driving, uh, you can open that one up. This one is a fixed panel, much like what you would find, again, on a Tesla. Um, overall, highway driving is, uh, is, is quite pleasant in this truck. It feels very stable, feels responsive. The uh, steering feedback is actually pretty good. Um, you know, better than you would expect on a truck with these kind of off-road tires on it. So, drive modes. Uh, you've got uh, five different main drive modes. Uh, All-purpose, sport, conserve, um, off-road, and towing, uh, which do different things, obviously. Uh, the all-purpose mode, uh, you know, is just your general, obviously, general driving mode. So, the sport mode, drops the ride height down to nine and a half inches from 10.1 inches um, and stiffens up the ride uh, and gives you maximum brake regen. Um, and then also at least this, you, can, you have the option to adjust these manually within each mode as well. Uh, conserve mode gives you maximum regen, um, soft ride, stability control on. Uh, the off-road mode lifts the suspension up to 15 inches of ground clearance, which is something you can't get on the Lightning. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to do some serious off-roading, you definitely want to take advantage of that mode. Uh, I'm not going to engage it right now on the highway. Um, one kind of odd detail uh, about this truck is the regen. You can have regen be either standard or high. Um, and in the high mode, when the battery is fully charged, uh, you know, when it, the, the way regenerative braking works is um, electric motors can work in both directions. So if you are applying electricity to an electric motor, uh, then it will turn and produce torque. But if you uh, stop applying the electricity to it and you let, uh, you turn it mechanically, it becomes a generator. So it's a fully reversible process. Uh, so when you're coasting on the highway or you lift your foot off the accelerator um, and the momentum of the vehicle is what's driving uh, what's, what's driving it that will the wheels will be turning the electric motor uh, using it as a generator and putting energy back into the battery and so you have the option to have either standard mode which is sort of a coasting mode similar to what you would have on a conventional uh, internal combustion vehicle with an automatic transmission uh, or if you put it in high mode then it will give you much stronger regenerative braking. So when you lift off the accelerator, you can basically do one pedal driving. Now, in the F-150 and, and also in the Mach-E and, and a number of other vehicles, uh, they, have some, uh, they have some reserve power left in the battery that's not being used. So they never charge up to fully up to 100% state of charge in the battery. Um, and that's you know, to preserve the life of the battery. Um, but when you use high regen on those vehicles, uh, they, it always gives you that regen when you lift off the accelerator, no matter what the state of charge of the battery is. And it's not clear if they're just using some of that, a little bit of that buffer to store some of that energy, or they might, uh, what it might actually be doing is if the battery can't absorb any energy, it might be using the brake actuator for the stability control. Um, to actually use the friction brakes in that case to simulate regen, which is weird because regen is simulating what the brakes do. Uh, but at, at any rate, it, you always get the same response when you lift off the accelerator pedal. Um, so it, it's always consistent. And I think that's actually really important when you drive is you want the vehicle to behave consistently to any given control input. You don't want inconsistent behavior uh, because then you might lift off and it's it's not suddenly it's not slowing down and you know then it might take you a moment before you hit the brake pedal uh, and you start to actually get some deceleration and that could be a problem uh, from a safety perspective so uh, what uh, you know in most of most other EVs that's what they do this one as well as in the Toyota BZ4X which I recently drove that's Toyota's first new uh, EV um, they, uh, instead of um, either using the, the friction brakes to uh, provide the braking uh, if the battery's too full, um, they actually just give you a warning and say, you know, hey, the battery's full, I can't do any regen right now. So you get a warning on your instrument cluster, which is kind of annoying. You may, you may not even notice it, and you suddenly may lift off and not be getting the amount of deceleration you expected. And, 
and I think that's a bad way of doing it. Uh, so I think uh, I think Rivian needs to make an adjustment there to how they're handling that. And I've, I've also told the same thing to Toyota, that they, they need to change the way they're handling it, and particularly in the case of the Toyota. They actually give you a message on the cluster that the way it reads, it actually reads like there's, an, like there's some sort of fault, some sort of diagnostic fault with the regenerative system uh, just because of the way they worded it. So I think Toyota is probably actually going to change the wording on that, but I don't know if they're going to change the way they handle that situation. But I think you know, Rivian should seriously consider changing that, uh, changing how they handle regenerative braking when the battery is completely full. So overall, you know, so far we've been mostly on fairly smooth roads with this truck. Um, and you know, it, it's had a, a fairly decent ride quality. But I have noticed over the last couple of days, when I take it over some rougher pavement, um, it's, this one doesn't feel uh, quite as uh, quite as smooth, quite as supple as the suspension on the Lightning. The Lightning, <laughs> amazingly enough, uh, you know, now it's got an independent rear suspension, um, actually feels better controlled, has better body control than this truck does. Uh, and I think you know, feel for you know, for a 6,500 pound truck, it feels very impressive. Uh, you know, this is actually even heavier. Um, and with an air spring suspension system, I would expect it to to feel a little smoother. Now, granted, I did have it uh, in the, the normal ride mode. So let's see. Oh no, actually, sorry. It's in, yeah. So let's put it in. It's in. It's in soft mode now. I haven't even had it in stiff mode. Um, so I think you know. Rivian might want to take another look, you know, maybe add another mode, maybe an even softer mode for a little more comfortable drive when you're on, on really rough pavement. Um, you know, and then, you know, have the, you know, maybe a normal, you know, uh, or touring mode and then, and then the sport mode for, you know, the stiff mode uh, when you want uh, the best handling capabilities. Rivian uh, has done all of the software for this vehicle in-house. They've done a lot of software updates since it launched last fall. Um, and uh, it has, has gotten better since the first time I drove it uh, briefly last fall. Uh, but um, it, you know, there's still some bugs in here. Like for example, I'm not able to get uh, the Alexa voice services uh, to let me log in. Uh, it, it just, it's uh, grayed out when I try to set it up. And that is what they are using for the voice recognition in here. Um, there is no support for Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Um, so what you have is what you get. Um, let's see, in here, uh, they do have Spotify and TuneIn built in, um, and of course Bluetooth support. And there's a premium sound system uh, with uh, an equalizer that you can set up here. Um, Uh, and if you uh, have a paired phone, uh, you can use that as well, uh, just streaming over Bluetooth in the old-fashioned way, but, but no, no smartphone projection. Um, one of the uh, interesting things that, uh, uh, that Rivian has done, uh, the graphics on the screen and on the instrument cluster uh, have all been developed using Unreal Engine. Um, so he's actually using a gaming engine to do the graphics. And the graphics look quite nice, they're, they're quite attractive. Uh, the system is generally pretty responsive. Uh, it doesn't, there's no real lagginess like we saw when we first drove the VW ID4. That, that vehicle had a really laggy infotainment system. This, this truck does not have that problem. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, apart from not being able to use your smartphone projection, it's, uh, it works quite well. Although sometimes it does take a bit for the maps to load. <laughs> So let's see where we're at now. So since I left the house, uh, we are running at 2.33 miles per kilowatt hour, which is actually pretty good, better than I expected, especially for highway driving. We've just been mostly highway driving up to this point. Uh, so it's actually doing a little bit better than the F-150. Um, used a total of eight kilowatts of, kilowatt hours of energy uh, to go about, almost 19 miles. So. Overall, I would say the, the Rivian R1T is, is, a, is a really strong first effort from a new automaker. Uh, you know, Rivian has never manufactured anything before. Um, they hired a lot of uh, really smart people from uh, auto industry and from other industries uh, with experience in manufacturing, experience in design. Uh, this thing seems really solidly put together. Um, the, the fit and finish, 
quality of this truck uh, feel pretty impressive, which granted, you know, they should be for, you know, a truck that costs almost $90,000, uh, but it's definitely a very solid first effort. Now, the challenge Rivian has had, unfortunately, is it turned out that um, they underestimated the costs to build this vehicle and also the R1S, and they have uh, recently raised the prices on these. Um, what, what they sort of did a, a hidden price rise because what they did was they actually introduced or they announced uh, some uh, some new variants of these of the truck and the SUV at um, the same price point that they initially launched at, but with uh, different hardware. So instead of the four motor configuration that you find in this truck, it comes with a dual motor configuration, which. You know, granted, I think for most people will be more than adequate because it's still over 600 horsepower and over 700 foot-pounds of torque, so similar, similar performance to the Lightning. Um, and this one is even quicker. This one will do 0 to 60 in 3 seconds uh, with its uh, over 800 horsepower and 900 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, but uh, the uh, new standard version also comes with a smaller capacity battery pack. It's a lithium iron phosphate pack instead of a nickel manganese cobalt pack, which is what's in here. Uh, that's not in and of itself a problem, but it's something you should be aware of. So it's going to have a shorter range of about 260 miles when it comes out. If you want to replicate uh, what's in this truck, it will now cost about $12,000 more than it did when these trucks were first ordered last year. One thing about changing the, uh, the ride height in this truck, um, it actually takes a surprising amount of time. I was trying it out the other day, and to go from normal ride height up to the, high, the maximum ride height for the off-road mode, the 15-inch the ground clearance, actually took um, about uh, three or four minutes to actually slowly raise the truck up from its low position to its high position. It's gonna get up here a little bit and we'll try a little acceleration test. All right. And that's 60. So <laughs> you can look at the, uh, the timer and, and see how long that took, uh, but it didn't take long. And it, it's definitely not something I think you wanna do all the time. Um, I think, you know, that's, it's not a particularly pleasant feeling having that level of acceleration on a constant basis. So as I said in the introduction, uh, the, the Rivian R1T and the F-150 Lightning are both on the market today. Um, they're, they're both more or less available I and mean, there's a, quite a long backlog for each one of them. But they're, despite both being pickup trucks, they are quite different. The Lightning is larger, um, has more payload capacity, and it's really targeted at a very different user than this truck. This, this is not targeted at the F-150 user, um, except maybe you know, if what you currently use is a Raptor, an F-150 Raptor. Um, this, this is really more targeted at the premium Jeep customer or you know, Range Rover, Land Rover customer. Uh, this, this truck is dimensionally almost identical to the uh, Jeep Gladiator, um, has way more performance than the Gladiator, um, has some really impressive off-road capability, um, especially compared to uh, compared to the Jeep, with the um, the four motors, one driving each wheel individually. They're not wheel motors, so the the wheel the motors are actually mounted in boards, but there's one motor driving each wheel. You can do four-way torque vectoring um, that can help. Uh, help the vehicle maneuver better in off-road conditions and also apply the torque where it's needed um, under, under any conditions. So when you're you know, crawling down the Rubicon Trail uh, following your friend in their Wrangler uh, or Gladiator, you know, it'll be able to put the torque down you know, when your wheels are actually on the ground and apply all the torque where, where, it's, uh, where it can do the most good. And the, the beauty of driving an EV off-road is you have that instant torque from an electric motor. So you don't need a low crawl gear ratio. Uh, for example, the Wrangler, the Wrangler Rubicon, you can have, I think it's up to a, a 95 to 1 crawl ratio. Um, so you get maximum torque multiplication when you're pulling up a steep hill or over a boulder or something like that. Um, because this has its maximum torque right from zero RPM, there's no need for that. 
so uh, you know same thing goes is true for the uh, the GMC Hummer although the Hummer because it's so large there's a lot of places it's just not going to be able to fit where this thing is going to fit much more easily um, so if what you want is an off-road lifestyle adventure vehicle Rivian has all kinds of accessories that are available for this uh, including a tent accessory that can go up on the roof or over the bed um, you've got the camp stove that I mentioned all kinds of other stuff uh, this is this is the truck for you if what you want is an electric truck ooh, I do like that acceleration if what you want is an electric truck for doing work doing actual work uh, you know, if you're a landscaper uh, towing uh, towing your mowers and everything else around or contractor or plumber then uh, the the lightning is probably the better choice for you um, you know and you know each one was designed for a purpose these are these are tools that have specific use cases you know you don't you don't use a hammer to drive in a screw uh, well you could but it wouldn't be a very effective approach um, so you know think about what you want to do with a truck and you could either one of these you're not going to go far wrong uh, with selecting either the Rivian or the uh, F-150 um, just pick the right one for the job that you want to do. For Twit, I'm Sam Abu Al-Samad.